camel bells tinkling, a caravan arrives down a steep mountain path in the foothills of the Kunlun Mountains. The loads of the camels are not ordinary rocks. They're jade from Kunlun, which has been famous in China throughout history. Today, they get the jade by digging shafts in the mountainside. For more than 2,000 years, jade has been collected here for carrying to the capital of China, far to the east. For the Silk Road didn't only carry silk, it also carried jade. The Kunlun Mountains are in the southern part of the Taklamakan Desert and they rise to about 6,000 meters or 20,000 feet. Deep in the mountain lies hidden the mysterious jade which the Chinese have always regarded with awe. The Kunlun jade was believed to have strange powers, perhaps because its brilliance seems to increase with age. Chinese people have always loved to make things of jade. They believe that if you wear jade, your mortal body will not die, but be preserved, so its spirit can one day return. Some great kings were even buried in complete jade suits. This one was made of almost 2,500 separate pieces of jade fastened together with gold thread. This marvellous suit of clothes was made 2,000 years ago, but only recently excavated. We can see plainly that the people of the past loved jade as much as they do today. The southern route to the western lands runs between the Kunlun Mountains and the Taklamakan Desert. Now the Chinese-Japanese expedition was headed for the biggest of the oases on this part of the road. It's called He Tien. Approaching from the east, you cross the Yorongkash River. Two rivers from the Kunlun Mountains flow through He Tien, the Yorongkash in the east and the Karakash in the west. Even today, you can often see people searching the riverbeds for jade. They say that if you spot a stone that seems to glow more brightly than the rest, you found a piece of jade. But jade is rare, and you're lucky if you can find one piece a day. We crossed the river and came to He Tien City. This town once had a great castle from which the whole country was ruled. 
It was famous as a source of the precious jade and as a trading center for the east-west commerce. We were the first foreign expedition that had ever come here. The population of Hötien province is 180,000 and of these 95% are of the Uyghur tribe. Their ancestors were people of Turkic blood that lived on the Mongolian plateau. The men wear many different kinds of headgear. The women wear coloured scarves and rings in their ears. They're all Muslims and they're a cheerful, simple people. In the middle of the town, there's a market for the jade. It's the only place where people can sell the jade they found. This isn't jade, it's just ordinary stone. Take another look. It's very heavy. The jade is valued and bought here. The valuers are working for the Hötien Light Industry Office. This one's only poor quality. It's only worth three yuan per kilogram. Come on, you can do better than that. We saw a Uyghur father and son, the same ones we'd seen looking for jade in the river. They'd come to sell their finds. That's a good one, isn't it? Second class white. I'll give you 50 yuan per kilo. You must be joking, look at the sheen. Sorry, the price is fixed by the government. Today they were selling the pieces they'd found over a six month period. He got 70 yuan, more than a labourer can earn in a month. The jade, which was travelling eastwards, and the silk, which was going westwards, were of the greatest importance to Hu Tien. The Chinese priest Xu Zhang, who travelled to India during the 7th century to bring back holy Buddhist books, stopped here on his way home. He wrote, This area has good land for growing grain, and fruit is also plentiful. The people wear clothes of silk and cotton, and they're very clever at weaving the silk, and also at making rugs. Xu <laughs> <laughs> Zhang recorded an old legend about how silk first came here. In the old days, it was forbidden to take silkworms out of China. But the king of He Tian wanted to make silk in his own country, so he asked the Chinese princess, who was to be his bride, to bring some cocoons with her.
she did what he had asked her and hid the cocoons in her crown when she came to marry the king. It's not known exactly when sericulture came to He Tien, but the legend suggests that the art was imported from China at a very early period. There's a very old painting of the ancient legend that was discovered by the British explorer Stein at the beginning of the 20th century. He found it in the ruins of a Buddhist temple at a place called Dan Dan Oilik, about 100 kilometers or 65 miles northeast of Hertien in the middle of the desert. You can see a servant girl pointing to the princess's crown where she's hidden the silk cocoons. Since Stein discovered this marvellous painting, no one has ever been back to Dan Dan Oilik to confirm its position. In the Uyghur language, Dan Dan Oilik means either the house of ivory or the house with an ivory treasure. After travelling for two days, we found the ruins of an old resting place in the desert. We found the remains of an old well, a few desert plants, and the ruins of a number of walls made from sun-dried bricks. The ruins are from the Han or the Tang dynasty, and they were once a Buddhist temple. On a low hill, there are the ruins of a stupa, a sort of pagoda. The people here call it the Dandan Oilik Tower. The temple had more than 300 priests. The marks in the walls were probably made by robbers looking for treasure. This painting of a king of Hertien is from a mural at Dunhuang. The Hertienese Empire ruled the Taklamakan Desert from the time of the Han Dynasty to the Tang. In the painting, you can see that the king is holding an incense burner made from jade. The fresh green color of the jade, the color prized most highly by the Chinese, shows how rich and powerful he was.
On the ground near the stupa, many prayer beads and decorative objects made of jade can be found. This tiny image shows two monkey-like beings with tails embracing each other. It's a common motif of early Buddhist sculpture. Hertien was the first place in the Western lands to become Buddhist. But according to Stein's map, the Dandan oilic he found wasn't here, but deeper in the desert, about 50 kilometers or 30 miles away. We decided to search for it from the air. Our plane was a biplane transport of the PLA. Stein travelled north from Hertien city along the Yurong Kash River and then eastwards from the point it joins the Kara Kash River. According to Stein, Dandan Oilik is at 37 degrees 46 minutes north and 81 degrees 7 minutes east. About 40 kilometers north of Hertien, or 25 miles, we found the ruins of a temple called Rawak, which has the biggest stupa on the southern route of the Silk Road. The top of the stupa has been broken off, and now all you can see is the ruin of the foundation, a little higher than the level of the sand. This is a photograph Stein took of Rawak Temple in 1900. There were more than 80 figures dressed in robes carved on the walls, but their heads had all been knocked off. Stein thought this had probably been done by Muslims who have a religious prejudice against images. Now we reach the place where Dandan Oilik is supposed to be. But after two hours of search, we still hadn't found anything that looked like the ruins of a temple. But we did find this crescent-shaped ruin half buried in the sand. The wall seems to have originally been a circle about 50 meters in diameter, or 150 feet, with a square building, perhaps a house, in the middle. One archaeologist thought that the circular wall had probably enclosed a field.
But from the air, the Taklamakan Desert looks like a sea of sand. It seems to have almost completely engulfed the remains of the people who once lived here. Artists of the Shin Yu song and dance troupe are performing the silk dance. The small white objects are silk cocoons. Most of the 56 people's corporations in today's He Tien are involved in breeding silkworms. Every year they produce five million yuan's worth of woven silk material and it's the principal industry of the oasis. The people are very proud of their produce and when they talk about silk their faces light up. On Sunday mornings, the roads are busy with traffic from the villages, because Sunday is Bazaar Day in He Tien. People come from the Kunlun Mountains and from the next oasis across the desert to buy and sell. The bazaar is held at a crossroads at the center of He Tien. On the road leading from the east to the crossroads, there are lines of stalls for about 500 meters, a quarter of a mile. By noon, it's so busy, it seems that everybody in the entire town is there. Yeah. 
This old man came to sell a carpet which took him two whole months to make. The shoe shop is a popular place with young girls. But there are many other kinds of shops as well, including government stores, people's corporation shops, and privately owned stalls selling food and handicrafts. The shops are quite simple, but they can provide everything the people need. Here you can buy spices for cooking mutton. Each bag is full of a different spice, and there are 97 of them. There's meat, and there's fish. These skewers are not of chicken, as they would be in Japan, but of mutton. They call it shish kebab. The Uyghur hats are so colourful, they sometimes look like bunches of flowers. <laughs> this one's too small, I can't get it on. It's a woman's hat. <laughs> what? A woman's hat? Is this yoghurt? How much is it? How many have you sold today? Only one. Here in a restaurant, they're selling freshly baked bread. Excuse me, uh, can I talk to you for a moment? Where did the ice come from? There's a place in the town that sells it. Why is it yellow? It's made of egg. 
Egg? Yes, it tastes like egg. What's it like? Good. Very good. They say the people of Hertien like to come to the bazaar whether they want to buy and sell or not. The Uyghurs love a crowd, and the bazaar is a weekly treat for them. It's afternoon, and although it's still only May, the temperature is already almost 30 degrees Celsius, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Here, at the oasis, everybody takes a siesta until two in the afternoon. We found the village coffee shop in the shade of a poplar-lined avenue. The small stream and pools are important water supplies for the people of the oasis. Everybody uses this water for drinking and for washing. This is a typical Uyghur farmhouse. You go through two doors into a sort of courtyard which has a roofed walkway around it. The platform in the middle is the family's living space, and in the summer, they sleep here. That's one of the advantages of living in the desert. You don't have to worry about rain. This is the master of the house, Mr. Mata Kashim. This is the room for me and my wife. When we Uyghurs visit anyone, the men all sleep in one room and the women in another. This room belongs to my two daughters. The older is 19 years old, almost old enough to be married. My wife and I are trying to get used to the idea. Except for beds, there's very little furniture. This is probably because these people were once nomads, wandering from one oasis to the next.
That was a big lump. Where does the ice come from? The river. When do you fill your ice house? In the middle of January. Ah, in winter time. They fill their ice houses with layers of ice and straw, a method that's been passed down from olden days. The ice was being taken to the Silk Research Center. They need it to keep the silkworms cool. In Hötien, making rugs is almost as old as weaving silk. They make very good rugs here using the Persian way of knotting. It takes five or six people to make a rug. They use several hundred dyed woolen warps for each rug. The different colors are knotted into the design bit by bit. Even the most skillful weaver, one who's been doing it since he was a child, can only make about two centimeters of rug in a whole day. It's work that needs the utmost patience. At two o'clock on Friday afternoon, a voice can be heard calling the faithful to the mosque, which is called Xin Jian Si. Marco Polo, who stayed in Hetian during the 14th century, said that all the people were already Muslims by that time.
But Hötien was originally a Buddhist country. It wasn't converted to Islam until the 10th century. Until 1948, the Imam of the mosque was the ruler of Hötien. <laughs> In China today, there is freedom of religion, and more than 5,000 people often attend the mosque on Fridays. But all the worshippers at the mosque are men. Women Muslims don't go to the mosque, but pray at home. When they pray, the people here face west, the direction of Mecca in far off Arabia. The sound of prayer has echoed here for many centuries. And still the Silk Road continues west, in the direction the Muslims are facing. Towards the end of our journey on this southern route of the Silk Road, we saw an oil field and natural gas gushing out into the desert. It was the Kokya oil field, which was only discovered in 1977 in the middle of the desert, about 200 kilometers from Hötien city, 120 miles. They're still making test wells, and of the 18 wells they've dug, three produced oil. Now they're making tests to find out the size of the reserves. Oil and natural gas started to flow from test well number 10 some time ago, and they still haven't controlled the flow. This southern route is the oldest part of the Silk Road and it was opened up to carry silk and jade. Today it's a place for the technology of a new age. 
As the Silk Road continues westwards, it divides into two. One leads to the town of Kashgar, to the west of the Taklamakan Desert, and the other crosses the Pamirs and goes on to Pakistan.